I'd like to call the August 7th, 2017 Davie County Commissioner's meeting to order. This time I'll ask Commissioner Jones to lead us in the invocation. Let us pray. Father, we come here tonight, uh, Lord, in awe of your mercy, your grace, and your goodness. Father, you've placed us in this freest of all lands. Father, you've called men and women to bleed and die on battlefields that we might be free today. Lord, uh, we thank you for them. Father, we thank you for our law enforcement, our fire, our EMS. Father, that uh, sacrifice time and life and family that they might, that we might be free in our homes and safe in our schools. And so, Lord, uh, we praise you and thank you for them also. Father, uh, we just pray that you would give us wisdom and knowledge and passion and boldness, Father, to do what you've called us to do. Father, to stand for freedom. Father, to stand for uh, liberty. And Lord, most of all, to stand for the values and principles, Lord, that you've laid down uh, in the life of this nation. So, Father, we come here tonight uh, with, um, with worship and praise in our hearts, even as we do the business of this great county you've placed us in. And uh, we come here and pray this prayer in the wonderful name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right. First item we have is to adopt the agenda. I'd like to make that motion. So moved. Motion to have a second. 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 All in favor, raise your hand. Okay. The agenda is adopted. Next, we move to public comment. Mr. Vogel. Mr. Chairman, no one signed up for public comments tonight, so we'll have that. Okay. All right, next, we have a couple presentations. The first is an economic development presentation from um, Mr. Ted Abernathy, but uh, Mr. Eller's got some introdu introductory remarks there. Sure. So uh, I want to uh, brag about Mr. Abernathy. He's been with us all day. He's held three uh, community sessions, uh, and I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Ter Terry Brawley for uh, allowing him to be with us today when. Um, we started talking about this project a few months ago, uh, shortly after my arrival. Uh, Mr. Brawley and myself said, you know, we need, to, we need to phase into our county strategic plan because he needed to do some things with economic development as well. And so we decided to start with um, the economic leadership of uh, Ted Abernathy, and that's who he represents. And so uh, we wanted to have some citizen input sessions, and, and that occurred today. Uh, I, as all of you know, with our strategic plan that we'll be presenting to you in the next uh, couple months, I've been uh, making a lot of, of rounds and meeting with different groups in the county as well. So all these things really dovetail and streamline together uh, nicely. But um, as uh, Mr. Brawley will tell you, uh, Ted comes highly recommended to us. Uh, he's got several slides tonight. Um, I told him, you know, we only have 30 minutes, Ted, uh, he, and he promised me uh, uh, we'd try to get through that. There's a ton of data in these slides, uh, and, and it's online, so for any citizen who wants to look at it, I did tell them a lot of things that we were interested in as a county, wanting to get information on. So, uh, Ted, thanks for being here tonight. We're just going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. County managers are always great at these kind of meetings. They always say, I want you to cover these 83 things. I want you to do it in four minutes. And, uh, <laughs> So we're going to try to do that tonight. I'll, I'll move through some slides fairly quickly and then stop on a few that I think are important to you. But we wanted to make sure that you had the information as we go forward. The, uh, the economy that we're all in right now has been moving forward for a few years. We look back post-recession for the last five years. North Carolina has been outperforming the country. The national growth rate has been about 9.6%. North Carolina about 11. Where a lot of that growth has taken place Let's see. So you tell me how to go forward. There we go. 
there we go, has taken place in the high-tech sector. And uh, you can see on this slide, North Carolina is ranked third in, in technology. The bad news about those jobs is they've been concentrated heavily in four or five counties. In fact, 50% of them are in Wake County alone. And so what we've seen around the state is a fairly uneven job growth. <coughs> North Carolina is middle of the country in terms of job growth. The country's been growing at about 1.6% over the last 12 months. North Carolina's at 1.7. You can see that there are states that are doing considerably better than us, but we're in the middle of the pack on the up end. And our growth here has always been connected to the nation. This is average uh, employment growth back to 1990 by year compared to the country. And so what the chart should tell you is so goes the national economy, so goes our economy. We're, uh, we're a big diversified state and unlike a state like North Dakota that might get out of line with the country because they're energy based, North Carolina tends to follow the nation pretty closely. The other thing it should tell you is the last few years we've been outperforming the country just slightly in job growth. It's the red line over the black line at the far end. I'm not going to spend any time on the sectors other than to say that manufacturing in North Carolina has been an area that hasn't grown much. Uh, we've seen a lot more growth in business and professional services. Your county is an exception to that as you've grown, and so you should uh, take a great deal of pride in that. When we look at average employment uh, for the last year that's complete, which is December of 16, you can see that almost every county in North Carolina added employment. Employment numbers are the people who reside in a county. So it means more of the citizens of that county are working. So you can see the light green and the dark green. Davie in this county, in case is a light green county, which means you've been growing between zero and three percent. There are only about six counties that aren't growing. So when we we talk about the counties not being even. Uh, part of it is that there's some places growing pretty fast, but overall, the state's been doing pretty well. I'm going to add one slide as we go forward here. This is jobs, and jobs, this is the same period, but jobs are the jobs within a county. So it doesn't make any difference who's taking those jobs. And you can see a lot more counties have been losing jobs than losing employment. What that means is more people are commuting outside of rural counties into the concentrations where jobs are. We're seeing that all over the state. Like I said, I'm going to skip past the employment gain stuff. You can, you can look at that at your leisure. When we're looking at this community and all communities, we try to look at what makes you competitive. And that's the first thing about uh, an economic plan. These are the top factors in order this year. The, on the left there is 2016 for that uh, the uh, CEOs and site selection consultants say are the most important. The numbers on the right are from 2012. And as you can see, the top things have stayed the same. It's availability of skilled labor, and we hear that by everybody these days, highway accessibility and labor cost. What's different in the last couple of years is that available land and buildings, available buildings, have risen to the top. And that's because nationally there are fewer buildings and, and prepared sites available. And they've gotten to be very important. It's a concern in your community because you don't have a lot of product. And product, as you can see, becomes an important part of decision making for new investment. You're in a state that's very well placed currently. This is uh, tax rates across the country. This is all the southern states and the overall ranking is on the far left. If the rankings for corporate individual income, sales and property tax are there, if you're red on the chart, you're one of the 15 highest. If you're green, you're one of the 15 lowest. White's in the middle. And as you can see, North Carolina, very competitive for corporate tax and was cut again this year, very competitive for income tax. A little higher, the highest thing is property tax and we've seen that shift over the last few years. As income has come down for corporations and individuals, property taxes have had to rise to take up some of that. We all know how that works at the county level better than anybody. When we look nationwide at economic performance and we use the top three indicators of wage growth, job growth, and GDP growth, the States in green are the top third of the country, and North Carolina enjoys that, as does the whole southeastern seaboard. It's been a good time for our state. We've been adding a lot of jobs. Wages have been growing, and GDP's been growing. 
But as we go forward, there are some trends that are shaping competitiveness, and I'm going to talk about four of them today quickly. We, we do a lot of work for private companies, and we look at 21 of these, but here's four of them as we go forward for you. The first is that the population of America is urbanizing, and that urbanization is accelerating at a faster rate than it ever has in our history. We, uh, we are a state that a lot of people are moving to. Uh, over the last five years, 180,000 new people moved to North Carolina. And you can see on the chart, it's been a time, an interesting time in America where there are big winners and big losers, more so than ever before. Texas, Florida, Colorado, North Carolina, Arizona, South Carolina, big growth. When you think about it, Florida added 650,000 new citizens in the last five years. New York lost 650,000 citizens in the last five years. That's big shifts in our country. What it does for North Carolina at a time when national, job, national employment growth is pretty slow, it means that we're able to fuel growth through people moving. Most people are moving into metropolitan areas. And you're counted as part of the Winston-Salem metropolitan area, but the more dense areas of the country are getting a lot more people moving to them. As you can see the chart, uh, the uh, uh, orange line on there, uh, Non-metro areas aren't even back to where they were before the recession. And the line's flattened out. There are people who think that uh, most of the country, in fact, might end up just shrinking over time. It's happened in North Carolina. Uh, one of the things that, that doesn't get a lot of play is that as Americans, we're actually moving a lot less. This is part of the dynamism, uh, one of the three things in dynamism that's hurting us as a country. Back in the 60s and 70s, about 3% of the population moved each year. Now only 1.5% moves each year, so there are fewer people moving and fewer places able to attract those people. So if you think about the chart before, there's some big winners, some big losers, but everybody else is pretty flat. So it's harder to grow because people are more static. They won't even move for jobs. When we look at what happens with all that motion, half the country now lives in the dark purple areas. The other half lives in the light purple. So that's 142 counties that half the country lives in and a little over 3,000 that the other half lives in. And that concentration is getting more intense, more and more people. And you know, that's half the people, half the voters, two-thirds the GDP of the country in more and more concentrated areas. This is important for David County because you want to be one of the concentrated areas. When you look at population growth over the last five years in our state, you can see that you're in the light yellow. You've been growing, but at a slow rate. You can see real quickly that the places that are growing at 10% or more over that period of time are around Raleigh-Durham, around Charlotte, Wilmington, and that's about it. The other fast growth areas are Asheville, the areas around our military bases, and that's about the state. The bad news, of course, is that all the red counties lost population during that period of time. And as we look forward for the next few years, it gets a little bit worse. This is the projected labor force population growth for the next 20 years. And over that 20 year period, about half of North Carolina is expected to lose workers. Remember that workers are the number one determining factor of where new investment goes. So if you see a map like this and you know that you're losing workers, you're in trouble. Good news for you, you're on the positive side of this. You're growing, but slightly below the state average in growing. And as you can see to your north and west, it, uh, the growth rates are, are pretty pretty bad, a lot of red, uh, Iredale doing better to the, to the far west. So as we go forward with the urbanization, the question is, are you one of those places that are going to grow? Are you going to have the ability to attract young people and new families into the community, or, or are you not? And that's, that trend runs against a lot of people. question for employers is that the skills bar is rising. More and more people expect our employees to have more and more skills, and those skills come into a, a, a different set. We're expecting everybody to have basic reading, writing, and arithmetic, a foundation, but then we have to have life skills, and those two bottom ones, the life skills and the foundation, are prerequisites. Employers, if you, if you can't show up, pass a drug test, have basic reading comprehension and math, you're not employable by most of our employers today. On top of that, you need work skills. You need communication, problem solving, teamwork, and those type of things that are transferable between jobs. You can teach those. doesn't matter where the jobs move in the future. You'll still be ready for them. On top of that are job skills. Our community college does a great job with that, whether it's welding or phlebotomy or whatever, specific skills. And then emerging in the future are future skills. 
integration with technology, cross-cultural competencies, all of those things that keep rising the bar. And so in order for your citizens, or me and you actually, to be prepared for the future, we're going to have to continue to improve our skills. There's no, there's no indication anywhere that they're going the other way. Doesn't mean everybody needs a four-year college degree. The projection for jobs for people entering college this year is that 23% of the jobs will need a four-year college degree <laughs> by the time they graduate. We're sending about 70% of kids to college, uh, two-thirds of those to four-year schools. They don't all graduate, but the truth is that where we're most underrepresented is our middle skill jobs right now. You can't find people with machinist skills, welding skills, the types of middle skills that are in high demand. So somewhere along the way, we have to change our workforce systems to meet that. Technological unemployment scares us. We know that the machines are coming, and uh, when they first started talking about this, we thought all the jobs would disappear, but we thought we'd all be working 15-hour weeks instead of 15-hour days. So not too good of future projections. When we talk about it, we tend to think about it in terms of manufacturing, and for you, that's a good thing. This is my, all four of my grandparents were textile workers in Gaston County, and that's what it looked like back then. J.P. Stevens and Bonet looked like that. Today, manufacturing jobs basically look like this. They're machinery with some people augmented in the middle of it. You have a lot of jobs here, but the robotics of what uh, is involved in manufacturing continues to expand doesn't mean that we've lost manufacturing. In North Carolina since 1998, no, 20 years ago, we actually produce 157% of the manufacturer's goods that we did back then. We actually produce more than 50% more manufactured goods. But we do it with 58% of the employers that we had before. So as automation continues to come in, we continue to be an amazing manufacturing country, but we do so more and more with robotics taking the jobs. There's no reason to believe that that's going to go the other way. Uh, when you look at our robots per person, uh, we're still behind Taiwan and Germany and Japan and Singapore, Korea, some of the places that we compete with regularly. So if you had to predict, you would predict more robotics uh, coming into our manufacturing in the coming years. Technology is, is filling the jobs that we can't fill otherwise, whether those are agriculture jobs or healthcare jobs, whether they're <laughs> Construction jobs, where we can't find skilled workers today, machines are being built every day to try to deal with that. And as we go forward, how, how we adapt our, our citizens to be ready for that is a key. New things in technology that are coming out around sensors, auto, autonomous vehicles, additive manufacturing, and artificial intelligence will continue to rewrite. And we spent some time today talking about how industries are going to change uh, here in Davie County. The business norms are also changing. Uh, we talk a lot about the net jobs that are created each year. We talk uh, in a quarter about 300,000 jobs are created. What we don't talk about is that 7.5 million jobs were added and 7.2 million jobs were lost to get you a net of 300,000. And that's nice to have a net, but it means that 7.2 million people probably lost their jobs during that quarter. And so there's a churn rate in our economy that's pretty startling. And it means that if Terry does a good job and fills every, every uh, building you have, you have a 3.8% unemployment rate, next month there'll need to be new job growth because you'll have lost jobs somewhere along the way. So that churn is an important part. It's also one of the things I told you, the dynamism of movement change, but so has the dynamism of small business. The U.S. private sector employment today, 47% of all employees are working for companies of 500 or more another 17% of 100 or more, so about two-thirds of our people work in businesses that aren't, wouldn't be by many, most standards, small business. This has gotten worse over the last few years as small business dynamism has been turned back by changes in lending, by loss of uh, equity in houses and some other things. We're at a time where our small business growth numbers are about as low as they've been in a very long time. So when we're looking at the plan for the EDC, it's four parts. It's building a multi-year action plan for the EDC that's, that basically lays out what they'll be doing over the next period of time. It's a cluster analysis that looks at what businesses are growing, what businesses you have a competitive advantage in, and what might happen. It builds a foundation, as the man county manager said, for future planning efforts. And we've been asked to take a special look at housing, retail, talent attraction, and incentives as part of the plan. 
When we look at sampling for clusters, clusters fall into sort of four categories. We look at two things, the growth in the, in the number of employees and something, a technical term called a location quotient, which measures how intense those businesses are in a given area. So the national average is one. If you have 1.5, you're more intense, which means you have a, a better concentration of it. If you're below, less. And what we're really looking for are the strong asset clusters. When we look at the triad in general, you're looking at uh, electronic commerce, you're looking at education and knowledge, a few other things that score the best. When we put that through a filter of Davie County, we think that the asset clusters that bleed over here and give you uh, real hope is aerospace vehicle, uh, I'm sorry, aerospace vehicles and defense, plastics and medical devices as core uh, places that are going to add jobs in the future, probably in this region. And if you have the right buildings and sites, you're going to be competitive for those. We'll do more of this as the plan fleshes, fleshes out. But those are the early clusters that look like you have some advantage here in the region. When we looked at housing, and I, I will admit we don't typically look at housing when we're doing economic strategies, but it is one of the areas that comes up in every conversation I have in Davie County. So we started looking at your housing stock. A couple things hopped out. The first is that you haven't built a lot of housing recently. A lot of your housing predates 1999. It's, a, it's an old housing stock, and as such, it is not quite as uh, attractive to a younger population as the type of housing that's being built today. We looked at uh, your housing by type. You are 92% either single family detached homes or mobile homes. Very few apartments or attached homes. You are 79% owner occupied. Last year in America, 37% of all the houses sold were sold as investor housing for, for rental. And home ownership is one of the lowest as it's been in our country in a long time, in over 50 years. So uh, you're a little out of step with where the housing market has been going. That might be good, that might be bad, but, but you're, you're a little atypical as we go look at housing. Uh, your gross rents fall almost all in the sort of middle range. Uh, you can see here the 500 to 999, and this is built on overall gross rents in the county. It doesn't really matter what a rent is. It matters what people can afford or not afford. And when we look at that, this is the percentage of household income paid for rent. And as you can see, for, for lower income residents, they're paying a higher percentage. The purple is where they're paying over 50% of their pay, and 30% is considered the target for appropriate affordableness. So at the lower end, your housing is expensive. Part of that is because you don't have a, a high supply. At the upper end, your housing is, n is either non-existent or relatively cheap. As we look a little further into it, a two-bedroom rental of a house uh, in Davie County, the average right now, uh, median rent is $637. To be able to afford that, you need to make about twenty-five five a year to be able to afford that as a as a regular thirty percent of your income. So, some of your jobs pay that; others do not. So, people it's a mix in, in what you get. When we look at your owner-occupied units, you have a real broad uh, groupings. Uh, everything from about a thousand units that are less than fifty thousand dollar owner valued, all the way up to about one hundred and fifty that are more than a million. So, it's a broad group of owner-occupied houses. And when we look at uh, your owner-occupied percentage of household income being paid for mortgages and others, you can see that the nobody's in the purple in the owner-occupied, but quite a few people over 30%, and 30% is sort of the, the national norm. So especially at the lower end, even in owner-occupied houses, people are spending a little more of their money on shelter than they would typically. And this is all, when you look at all households in both uh, rental and uh, home ownership, you can see that the, the real burdens are down at the lower end because of low, lower income people. The housing stock at the low end is, is not as much there. We also don't have much housing at the higher end. We have some million dollar houses, but there's, there seems to be a gap of the types of housing that you have. And we had a lot of conversation today of whether or not you had housing that attracted, was attractive to young families <coughs> or to millennials, young people. And there seems to be a fairly good, uh, clear consensus that you're missing some pieces of the housing market. 
just mapped them for you. This is the single family houses sold in the last 12 months on the left. You can see they're, well, they're in the concentrations you might expect in the northeast section. And then there are 292 that are currently for sale. They're scattered all across the county. So it's not one concentration, but you can look pretty deeply at your, uh, at your sales markets for housing. And you can also look at the rental markets and see where you are. And we'll include a lot of this data with some recommendations in the final report. When millennials look for housing today, they, they, as you might expect, everybody thinks millennials are different, so they're surveyed quite a bit. And 50% uh, of them are renting, of all millennials, and another 21% live with their parents. So it's, uh, it's an interesting housing market. This, uh, even though that's true, they're still the largest home buyers because most baby boomers have their houses. So they're still moving into the marketplace and most of them say they want to own a single family detached house in the future, but they want a specific type. They want hardwood floors and they want granite countertops and fireplaces and they want a tech friendly house and they want open floor plans and all that stuff's nice and if you watch House Hunters you, can, you know that from watching television, but most of that stuff didn't exist in pre-2000 houses. That's just not the way we built houses. We built them differently. We had closed off kitchens. We had wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. And so your older housing stock probably is a hindrance to you as you try to attract millennials coming forward. So trying to get entice and developers to come in and build new housing stock probably is one of the things we'll end up recommending to you. There are some myths associated with with talent attraction, people, there's a myth that people aren't moving, that, you know, where they already have jobs, they're just moving and hoping to find a job. And the, and the truth is that people, about half residents, really locate for areas that have a lot of jobs. So they move to Austin without a job, but they move to Austin knowing that it has 2% unemployment and growing jobs dramatically. Not a lot of people are moving to places that aren't growing. Um, Salary, work-life bonus, uh, work-life balance, and, and sort of the benefits of a location trump a lot of things. But the top factors are still cost of living and housing costs and availability. And if your housing is higher priced here because you have a lower supply, then that's going to be a deterrent for, for younger people also. The other thing we were asked to look at is uh, real, uh, how real estate's changing, and especially retail. And uh, e-commerce is certainly impacting retail these days. But overall, real estate's changing pretty dramatically. The average office space per worker has dropped from 2010 to 2017 hugely, from 225 square feet per person to 151. What that means is you're going to have less tax base for new office buildings probably, because they're going to be smaller with more people in it. There'll be higher parking demands on them, so you're going to have impervious surface ratio issues. And as county commissioners, you're going to see that happen. For industrial space, the heights are going up uh, and the number of people in them are going down. More robotics, average height now in the mid-30s. And you're seeing uh, warehousing also beginning to move toward urban areas. Uh, a lot of the, the new shopping models, like we have, I live in Raleigh, uh, Amazon has two-hour delivery to my house. Anything I want from Amazon, they'll bring to my house in two hours. That means they have to have a warehouse pretty close to the center of the place. So we can't put warehousing out in low cost areas remote anymore. We have to bring it closer in. So parts of your, especially the north and east part of your county, are gonna have warehouse demands. Whether you want to zone for that, it's your decision. Uh, the robots have some tax base, but the build, it's not a lot of jobs associated with it these days. Retail stores, <laughs> as you know, you've seen this in all your, your newspapers, are closing dramatically this year. We're at a time where people are, are choosing different things. Mall, visits to malls are down about 30%. Last year we had over 200 closed in America and only a couple open. Uh, we still are a country where we have more retail space per individual than any place in the world, by a lot. And so we're starting to see that consolidation happen. As we look at new retail for this area, you start thinking about a, a virtual reality experience of retail. People can go online. An Amazon warehouse is built today to look like this. There are lots of things moving around, very few people in it. You don't need a lot. So retail has become a lot less job intensive as we move forward. Retails choose location based on formula. It's all math. We do some of it for companies. Uh, 
you know, 94% of the sales are still local, so it depends on how many rooftops and how many people and what the disposable income in that is. People look at a local marketplace, then they look at your trade area. Finally, they assess how much disposable income is spent on what types of, of items. And it's all a quantitative experience. So if you want a X, it means that there's a formula for X. And if you qualify, I can assure you people want to build the next one of those. And if you don't, unless you want to pay high incentive, you're not going to convince people to do that. So part of it is having land and, and water and sewer availability to sites that make sense, because without those, you don't get this. But the other part is about making sure that you understand where the demographics in your community are. And we can get down to granular levels. We know what by, by what type of, of uh, pay somebody makes, what they spend money on. So if you want to know why I don't have more department stores or why I have no more of this, it's really a math formula. And uh, as a big data geek, I, I can tell you that that's just what people ask us. You know, we, we do work for doctors' offices. You know, if you're doing orthopedic surgeons, how many kids between the boys between the ages of 14 and 19 whose parents have a high income live in this area and they put an orthopedic clinic there? It's just just the math that happens in those kind of things. I also looked at your retail sales. You actually are above the national, the state average as a county, and you're one of the few counties in the state that are above the state average. So you're already having pretty good retail sales. Doesn't mean you can't have more. Uh, you're you're near the state the state average, but you're already doing pretty well on overall retail sales. When we do corporate decision processes, uh, communities make a short list. Uh, if you make a short list, you get a visit and. You know, about a third of those decisions are made within a six months. Almost a third use site selection consultant. So when Terry's managing his projects, you know, you're not going to see them unless you're one of the final finalists, usually three to five. So you're never going to know which ones you missed, but you will know which ones you have an opportunity with, and they're going to want information that's at a granular level locally. What can you give them that's not? Uh, incentives are important, and we promised the county manager we'd take, do an assessment of your incentive policy, and we'll do that. Uh, for a lot of companies, they don't matter. For the ones that they do, they matter. And so the types of incentives that are really important are usually tax or tax substitution incentives. They fall in there, either rebates or things. I, I strongly recommend everybody have very strong incentives that are based on performance and have clawbacks. So you're only paying if you get what you want. You only keep, they only keep it if they do what they say. But you, your county attorney can certainly structure that. What we heard when we talked to the leadership group here at the beginning was that they thought your strengths were highway accessibility, a low union profile, your health care facilities, your public schools, including your new high school, and your low climb rates. They thought your weaknesses were your buildings and sites and the fact that you don't have much labor and housing availability. Well, I can tell you we heard that again with every focus group today. It sounded just like this. We asked the group uh, what should the focus be, recruitment efforts, utility infrastructure, and work skills. That was very clear in our groupings. We asked what role did we think, since work skills was such an issue, who should be taking the lead on that? And the education institutions were overall expected to take the lead, the K-12 system and the community college. They expected the economic development team to play a critical role. We also asked what types of businesses. Uh, Technology-based manufacturing, so all manufacturing today is advanced, but technology-based manufacturing and healthcare, they thought we had the best options, and I think those are good options going forward. And then today, finally, the last thing, when we, we met with overall today about 60-some people, uh, got a lot of input. Everybody wanted to talk about housing, and everybody wanted to talk about workforce. Those are both important, as you saw from floor. Not many people wanted to talk about your product. Nobody brought up buildings and sites, and they should have, because you don't have many of them. Uh, so people want to talk about infrastructure, and it's a prerequisite. You don't have a building or site unless you have adequate infrastructure going forward. A lot of people talked about quality of place, and the fact that you needed a place that was attractive to people to, to be there. And everybody, every group, talked about the need to try to be attractive to young adults, 25 to 45-year-olds, young families. Uh, it was, I think, a general belief that you probably weren't going to attract uh, the 25 single year old just out of college looking for the urban experience, but that you had a real chance of being competitive for the 32 year old young family who wanted a great place to live. 
if you had the right housing and the right amenities, and there would need to be a few more of those. Uh, county manager was in all those meetings, so he can maybe some add some things he heard, but uh, we were pleased with that. Our plan is to give you a draft plan in October, hopefully something you can chew on, we can fix in November, and you can adopt it before the end of the year. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And several of you participated today, so feel free to jump in on your thoughts. Yeah, that's a lot of information, very thorough. Uh, anybody have any questions for Mr. Abernathy or Mr. Brawley? You got anything you want to add to any of that? Uh, he's done a great job. I, I think so he's right on. I, I appreciate the leadership that John has shown getting us on task, and that is laying this plan out there for us today and even for the future. I mean, that's where we need to be concentrated. Where are the jobs going to be in the future? You know, that's what we need to find out. You know, the jobs of today are going to fade away at some point in time, and we're going to have to look to the future, and the next generation needs to know. I'd be remiss, I should say, there were quite a few people who wanted us to make sure we understood that there was farmland in the community that needed to be preserved. There was land that needed to have housing on it. There was, that you needed to have a plan to know where you wanted your commercial growth and your job centers. So I think tied into a strategy for economic development is how it overlays onto an overall growth strategy that you're going to work on. So we heard that consistently today also. So back to the timeline, you're going to present a draft in October and mm -hmm. maybe the final product uh, November, December? Correct. Okay. That's right. We wanted to make sure everything was in place for you before you kicked off your other work and before you started your budget for next year. All right. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a presentation of will be very exciting on internal controls for Davie County. Robin West. I apologize in advance for the dry nature of the material, but we'll try to get through quickly and as painlessly as possible. Uh, who is in charge of internal controls for the county? That goes for the, from everyone from the governing board to the county manager to department directors to county employees. Why do we care about this? <laughs> uh, internal controls give you timely and accurate financial reports that help you make informed decisions. A good internal controls should provide for more streamlined operational systems. Duplication of effort can also uh, be detected by a good internal control system. And also it helps you be in compliance with applicable laws like the uh, Local Government Budget and Fiscal Control Act, grantor requirements, requirements from the IRS, bond covenants and county and state laws. What exactly is internal controls? Is the system of, uh, the system of internal controls consists of policies and procedures and is designed to provide reasonable assurance for achievement of ob objectives relating to operations and it's for a government or entity of any size. You can't be too small to have internal controls. There are five components to internal controls as you see here. I'll go through each one briefly. Uh, the internal control environment is communicated through actions and examples. For example, do department directors follow policies, and if not, are there consequences? Uh, are competent staff with up-to-date skills hired? Job descriptions are kept up-to-date, hiring policies are followed, and employees are properly trained and performance is evaluated. And also, is the board independent of management and are its members actively involved in county activities? Risk assessment involves managers at all levels. Changes in operating environment include staff turnover, new technology, any restructuring, changes in regulatory environments and accounting standards. And also the uh, susceptibility to material error, error is called inherent risk. Some examples of this are complexity of transactions, prior internal control issues. Um, one of the next parts of internal control are control activities. Uh, this includes reviews of actual results versus your budget and versus prior period results. Uh, information processing activity ensures the accuracy, completeness, and authorization of transactions. 
Uh, does the director review records and transactions? This can help detect irregularities and unintentional errors. An example of physical controls are, is cash on hand under the sole control of the person directly responsible for it? Another important part are segregation of duties. Uh, you don't want the same person collecting the cash, depositing the cash, recording the transactions in the general ledger, and also rotation of duties where you cross-train your employees within departments and also have required vacation days. Uh, getting the inform right information to the right people is an important and also uh, timely, current, and accurate information. Are appropriate transactions recorded, properly valued, classified, timely, and are invalid transactions posted? Um, Monitoring of internal controls is ongoing so that you can consider where they operate if the way you intended and you can modify them as appropriate. Significant differences from director's knowledge of department operations are investigated. Uh, external parties such as taxpayers, water department complaints from customers, oversight agencies such as grantors, the LGC, and external auditors all play an important role in communicating internal control issues. That's all well and good, but how do we do it here in Davie County? Well, when someone is hired, we share information with the new staff, and uh, also whenever we update a policy, we provide training to all the related parties who have, have a part of that. It is also available on the county intranet. So uh, here, here is a list of some of the policies, the personnel policy, the purchasing policy, technology policy, and department procedure manuals. And also, we keep up-to-date job descriptions and trainings for people. And that's all how we do it in here in the county. And I will be glad to answer. I know you are full of questions about internal controls. I know this is just you know something that keeps you up at night, burning topics. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I will say our, our finance and budget office, our department heads, and, and our office, I think, do a, a fabulous job of second party reviews and controls um, this is this is kind of uh, new to us to do a presentation to y'all but our single county audits are changing and uh, as a result of that they're putting way more emphasis on internal controls in the past and that's not a bad thing uh, but I want you to to just know that as your manager I, I feel very uh, very good that we have competent department heads and uh, great staff leading this effort in our finance and budget office too so we've got the checks and balances in place that I think we need and we'll continue to look at those and review those and modify those as they need be uh, over time but I want to thank uh, uh, Miss West and Miss Hendricks and everyone else for their good work in this regard the controls environment is while the subject matter may be dry it's got a lot more focus over the past several years and it's going to continue to get more and more focus and um, ever everybody needs to take it very serious because it's kind of the first line of defense against a problem occurring so again it's easy to say it's dry and it is but still we do need to take it serious and be aware that we have a commitment to this so thank you Okay. Next, we move to public hearings. Um, first is changing some road names or appointing some road names. I'll call on John Gallimore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Board. Uh, you have two proposed road names on the agenda tonight. Both are here presented to you for public hearing. Uh, these are private roads with uh, two or more residential dwellings on them and um, have both of these have been advertised in our local newspaper as required with notices mailed to the individual property owners uh, the public notice was two weeks um, to the two weeks prior to this meeting tonight um, notices mailed to the property owners both of these road names were heard by the planning board and both were recommended uh, by a vote of seven in favor and none opposed uh, to adopt these road names that you have. Um, I've given you a lot of information in your agenda packets, but briefly, uh, these, both of these road names have come to us um, through the building process where homes are, or permits are petitioned or applied for 
uh, on the properties. And as part of our review, uh, we determined that uh, to help with 911 addressing and public safety to deliver emergency services to the homes, um, assigning addresses and assigning new road names to these private roads is the best way to do that. Um, these, there are existing homes on these uh, private driveways, so those homes would receive new addresses. Um, this is not a new process. This board has been through the road naming uh, in the past. Uh, if these road names are adopted, then we would uh, submit letters or send letters to the property owners and the residents letting them know what the new road names are and their new addresses are and then assist them with the process of, of changing those addresses. Um, there's a, a time process uh, involved with those homeowners and um, so they have plenty of time with the post office and other service providers to make those address changes. So we work with them to, to make sure that process is as smooth as possible. So um, the uh, planning board heard as I mentioned, but heard both of these proposed road names, recommended to approve, seven in favor and none opposed. And um, you can hear both of these road names at the same time, or you can hear them independently, uh, first one and then the other. Uh, it's at your discretion. So the recommended action or process would be to open up the public hearing, hear any comments either in favor or opposed, close the hearing, and then uh, make a decision on the road name. Um, I can answer any questions that you might have, anything that you've read, uh, or questions you might have from the minutes that, or the material that aren't answered, um, or we can leave it to, uh, to the public hearing first. Would there be a reason not to hear them together? It's, it's entirely at your uh, discretion. You can hear them all at one time, or you can hear them one after the other. It's, it's, it's really your choice. Preference. We'll hear them together. I guess if um, we have some individual questions, we can address them and vote on them individually, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, before Mr. Caldwell sits down for a minute, um, and we had a conversation about this a little bit earlier, but um, I, I think it would be helpful for me and for the public to understand what triggers the process where a road name comes up. So we are approached when building permits are applied for, uh, typically either a single family uh, manufactured home or a single family uh, dwelling is uh, applied for a building permit on a property. Uh, we look at the location and see if there are other existing homes on the same driveway. Uh, if there are two or more, uh, then we would uh, contact or let the petitioner know, the person applying for the permit, that the road needs to be named. We provide them forms to fill out and bring back to us with proposed road names. So at that point, it's a matter of not whether the road should be named, it's a matter of what the road, what the name should be. Um, so it's a, ma it's, it's a process of facilitating the building permit. Uh, these are homes that are, are, or property owners who are trying to move forward with their building process and we just can't accommodate that with the existing addresses that are in place. Um, sometimes there are homes that have been there a long time. Um, sometimes there are homes that have just been addressed recently in the past few years. Um, we try our best to accommodate existing addresses. We don't like to change addresses. That's not what we set out to do. Uh, but when we see that there is the potential for additional homes to be built on these private roads, uh, and to accommodate new permits, new homes being built, we want to make sure we take the right steps and comply with the ordinance and, and uh, assign the addresses, be able to assign addresses to these private roads. So it's a matter of accommodating new building construction, new development uh, to assign addresses. So basically this is a local law that was passed in like 1999, correct? No, sir. The original addressing ordinance was adopted in 1993. Okay, 93. The 911 addressing, readdressing project for the entire county was put in place in June of 1994. At that point, the entire county, with the exception of Moxville, was readdressed from rural route boxes to individual city-style street addresses, so a number and a road name. 
Um, prior to 94, the post office would frequently change routes and people would get new mailbox numbers. Um, people tend to forget that. And so that's, we've gotten accustomed to a good process and a good ordinance in place where we think ahead now. And so we, we plan for that and accommodate that. So it's been a long time since we've really had any major readdressing. These are small situations, um, not unimportant, but just smaller in numbers of, of changes. Just a couple of additional questions. So your flexibility is not in whether or not you change road name, it's just in terms of what the road name is, correct? That's correct. So we facilitate the process. We bring it to you um, to decide what the road name should be. We ask the owners to help us come up with names, but then ultimately it's this board under the current, or current ordinance, this board decides what that road name should be. And the concerns expressed to the planning board, if I read that correctly, were more with the fact that whether or not this process should even start or not, rather than the name itself? Well, I'm not sure. That's the sense I get from the folks um, who don't want to change the address. Uh, they want to keep what they have. Unfortunately, we don't have that flexibility in almost all of these cases. We're, we're out of numbers. And so we're, yes, I think they'd like to keep what they have, but we just don't have that ability. So my final question is, and I think I read this in, the, in talking to folks, I think I picked this up, is, is the sense that in this technology age where Google Maps or whatever direction finder you have will take you sometimes or most of the time to an address, why is it even necessary for us to have this process if there's some mechanism that would get 911 or our other in law enforcement providers uh, to that ad address. Can you can you answer that? I'll, I'll do my best to keep it um, not complicated. Right. So online services like Google and other mapping providers don't create anything. They harvest information. Local governments create that information, whether it's creating the road network or assigning the addresses or creating that linkage between the house number and the latitude longitude. So when an address is searched in Google, as an example, it takes that number and converts it into a coordinate pair. It then locates it on the map and that's what you see. It identifies that latitude longitude on the map. That works great when Google's maps are accurate and there are a lot of situations where they are. There are a lot of situations where they aren't. And what you'll see are people being misdirected. They follow directions on Google and they go down the wrong street. Or they drive off in a, you know, in an area they shouldn't be or they take a wrong turn. So it's up to the uh, local government to have accurate maps with accurate streets and accurate address points to tie those things together. Um, could it work? with just coordinates. Um, if, we, if people thought that way, I suppose it could, but all of our public safety services, their location and their directions hinge on a street address. And if we have numerous addresses on a single private road, where there, let's say the main road is Main Street, and you had three or five or 10 addresses down a meandering private driveway. That's a recipe for misdirection and confusion and delay and risk to the person making that 911 call. So it's up to us to make that process simpler. And we were fortunate this county years ago to develop this ordinance and this process to make sure we maintain that, um, that capability, that we can deliver services to those folks. Um, so that, that's why we do what we do. And one final follow-up, because um, I'm just now understanding this a little bit better myself. When somebody calls 911 for an emergency provider, law enforcement or EMS or fire departments or whatever it would be, how does that work exactly in terms of how does that provider get to that particular location? That, again, all depends on the information that we maintain. So we have staff that 
when a house is first addressed, uh, that point is put on the map. We provide that information to the telephone provider. They create a database that ties the phone number, the landline, to the physical address. There are also wireless databases that tie the mobile phone, typically, with a physical location. When you dial 911, that day, and this happens in milliseconds, really, that call connects to that database, which then provides that physical location back to our 911 center here. At that point, our software uh, can see that location, create a map that routes that the responders to that location. So it all hinges off of the street network that we build and maintain and those address points that we put on that map. All of our emergency service vehicles have maps in them, and the, the deputies and the EMS trucks. And so when that 911 call is made, it ties that physical location to a route that they can follow uh, to locate Can I ask you a brief question? The, the, um, you say there's multiple homes on both of these Yes. Road, John. Yes. Do they have sequential addresses now? In other words, um, uh, 103 Eller Drive, 105 Eller Drive, the two homes that are on the street, on, you call it a driveway, do they have sequential addresses right now? And I can, I can show you a picture of it, and there's also maps in yeah. there. But yeah. on, for instance, on, on the um, Dandelion Night, on Canatsa yeah. Road. There's a private road which leaves Canatsa Road and heads back off the road some distance. And those houses are numbered sequentially on Canatsa Road, mm -hmm. but they're really out of sequence because of the way we've had to address them to accommodate that. Um, so by adding another one in there, it, it's going to even further complicate that. In the case of Sparrow Lane, there's a house that's close to Callahan Road, and then and there's a the house. Callahan Road address. Yeah, both both of the houses on on the proposed spare lane have a Callahan Road address. One is close, so that's probably feasible in the evenings or whenever. The problem is if they're sharing that same driveway, three o'clock in the morning, yeah. somebody right, comes right. out there to respond. You know, most med most nine one one calls are medical, and in many situations, there's not someone there to say, well, with the first house, it's a panicking situation. I'd, I'd refer you to our fire marshal, Jerry Myers, who can talk about uh, a recent situation where callers just don't have the wherewithal to describe where they are. So if you're way back off the road, you might be sequential along Callahan Road, but you may not be in sequence on that private driveway. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. I guess the, the, the logical idea would be if there's a, if there are already sequential numbers on that street, which obviously they're not, because the, the then why can't the third party then just fall into the sequence, fall into the sequence, yeah. if that makes sense to you. Yeah, uh, that might work in the short term, but we'll be right back here when we run out of numbers, mm -hmm. and with. Property, and I think um, Mr. Allen on the planning board said it best, these properties can further develop and can be further subdivided, and we want to plan for that, and we want to be able to assign numbers that our emergency services can, can get to. Um, I'm in an odd situation because I don't work 911. I don't respond to emergency services, but here we are trying to facilitate that you know, by naming these roads. Could we just get you know one or more of our emergency providers just to weigh in, just to say, you know, that you need this system, Sheriff? Well, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Saturday, I was at Hunter's Helping Kids. It's on the Sweet Farm Trail off Callahan Road. There's two houses at the end of that. That if those two houses were addressed as Callahan Road. And the deputies up there, they're going to be riding up and down Callahan Road looking for those two addresses. They're not going to know that at the far end of Smoke Farm Lane, there's two houses back there. If that address is not a number 
with the street name of Smooth Farm Lane, the deputy's never going to know to go down that road. It's going to take him a longer time to figure that out. So, I mean, at some point you have to address things so they can be faint and be differentiated. I think there's another point here, and, and you emergency folks can speak to that, but these cross streets are something that's very, very important when you guys are going out somewhere. You need to know what cross street is because if you don't, you're going to get lost sometimes. So I think that's part of the whole 911 situation. The cross streets are vitally important. Mr. Chairman, if I could chime in here. First of all, I want to thank uh, Mr. Gallimore and Mr. Meadwell for, for the process that we have in place. Just so the board is aware, you know, just like all the other things as we identify the need to update uh, pieces, we're, we're talking about those as, as staff. So it's, it's good for me as the, the new guy to ask questions. But Mr. Vogler, Mr. Meadwell, Mr. Gallimore, myself, we are looking at this current process and figuring out are there ways we can make it uh, better. We've looked at some other counties and jurisdictions about how they handle these processes. So at some point in a future work group session, we'll be talking about that with you. But as you can see, the past few months, we're seeing more of these as development starts to occur. You heard what Mr. Abernathy said in his presentation. This issue is only going to keep happening. So we want to get ahead of it and make sure that our current policy and ordinance is the way that it needs to be. So uh, this is an issue that we'll be coming back to the board over the next few months to talk more about. This is, I guess, a curiosity question, but are you, is the county actually sharing this data with Google? Or are you uploading it or whatever mapping services? That's a great question. And we see this, we call it the Google effect, right? Just go online, it's free. It's free. Zillow gets it, it's free. Google, it's free. Bing, it's free. Well, no, it's not free because we pay for it. The taxpayers pay for it. It's on your phone bill. Your 911 surcharge pays for it. It's what we maintain with our addressing system. Now what we do is we provide it online for free download. It's up to them to pull that across into their system and then they, they make it work within their system. Now we will contact these companies and let them know that changes have occurred, whether it's the, you know, uh, the map providers that, that build this for Google, there's, there's a couple of main map providers, so we work with them. Uh, we notify them of these map changes, but we, we make it available free online. Uh, it's available for download, um, but they don't create any of that. We, the county creates that through our addressing processes, and that's normally, that's what all other counties do as part of their 911 system and their addressing system. So it's, it's made available. Um, we try to stay on top of it. If there's errors out there, there are fewer and fewer errors um, as time goes by, but um, we, we can't, it's never 100%, um, so we catch them where we can, but uh, we provide it to these companies. In the 9-11 the standard, I guess, is it, does it recognize these mapping services as a backup or y'all ever use those we don't use them okay. because we realize those are non-authoritative okay. in other words they're not the original creators of the data there are some 911 centers who rely on that information I wouldn't want to live in that community uh, I think that's um, it's done out of necessity out of fiscal constraints but I don't think it's a good approach so we want to have the best information, uh, the most timely information, and by us managing that and maintaining it and providing it to our first responders, uh, we know that it's right and we know that it's, it's accurate and we have a, a very good um, history here of keeping that up to date. Any other questions for Mr. Gallimore? Seeing none, this is a public hearing, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Vogler. Chairman's now this is the hour and date of the public hearing on the proposal to name two roads within the county, David, name, namely Dandelion Lane and Spare Lane, uh, pursuant to paragraph 94.140 of the David County Code of Ordinance. There's been a duly uh, publication of the notice of public hearing in the newspaper, the general circulation in David County is required by section. 
168-20G of the Act and the clerk to the board has attached the affidavit showing the publication of the said paper on a date at least 10 days prior to the, the state. I would ask anyone who wishes to comment at this public hearing come forward to the podium, state your name, and then comment either for or against uh, these proposals. Mr. Chair, I'm seeing no one come forward to comment. I would now turn the public hearing back over to the you as board chair and to the board closing the public hearing comment section of this public hearing provided you the opportunity to discuss among yourselves what, if any, action you wish to take with regards to this matter. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll declare the public hearing closed. Um, anybody have any questions or like to entertain a motion to or make a motion one way or another? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to adopt the two names of these roads. Okay. I have a motion on the floor to adopt both names as recommended by the planning board. Um, we have a second. 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 Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, the one thing I'll say that didn't come up here, but I think it came up in the planning board, is there is some burden on the property owners where this is triggered through you know, a new house coming on the on the block, and it's, you know, it, it is a pain, for lack of a better term, to have to change your driver's license and other documents and whatever. And I, I think uh, we get that. I think, though, the balance here, at least for me, is that the necessity to have a reliable means of getting to your house in case of emergency in a timely fashion has to be considered here. And, and I think the balance of things, I think it's uh, it's clear this is a reliable system and more reliable than anything that technology does. In fact, technology apparently relies upon what we do. So we have to, you know, get our law enforcement providers and emergency providers and fire departments out to your house as quickly as we possibly can. And, and I think this is the only way we can do it. Okay. Any other comments or questions? discussion okay seeing none I have a motion we have a motion on the floor with a second so all in favor of adopting these two names as recommended raise your hand that passes five zero thank you okay next we have a public hearing on the use of the county seal Uh, I'll present it then, Mr. Chairman. Now, what we've got uh, is, is a situation whereby I was asked a few months back whether or not our county seal was, in fact, uh, copyrighted or trademarked, or could anyone use that county seal, not just the county itself, use it. Uh, did some research in on that, uh, and found uh, that there was a case uh, in Ray City of Houston uh, that was came out of the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit uh, at that time uh, in which the judges indicated that you could not obtain a copyright or a trademark under the uh, Lehman Act uh, and, and the Trademark Act of 1946. Uh, that case went all the way up to the Supreme Court and they ruled uh, that the circuit judges were correct. You could not do that. Uh, but they did in some dictum indicate that you could still pass a county or city ordinance uh, wherein no one had the opportunity to use your county seal or your city seal, your city insignia. Uh, I then contacted the Secretary of State's office because they uh, actually have some that are registered. Uh, and talked with them down there, uh, got them to send me an email, and basically what they had done was prior to the city of Houston, NRA city of Houston case, North Carolina used to do uh, registration trademarks of, of county seals and city seals uh, there in the Secretary of State's office. They no longer do that. They have changed their the North Carolina Trademark Act to take into consideration the federal court case. Uh, and as municipal seals are being
coming up for renewal, they're refusing to renew any of those. Uh, again, uh, discussing discussions with them, uh, they indicated that there was nothing that would uh, prohibit a county, though, from uh, enacting a local ordinance wherein uh, you could uh, prohibit anyone from using your county seat. Uh, therefore, I brought that to the attention of the county manager who, uh, I think, talked with y'all in discussion. Last month, you passed a, a resolution uh, in which you instructed me to proceed further with the uh, uh, drafting of a county ordinance to take care of that. Um, in your package, you have a proposed new section 130-03 county seal ordinance for Davy County uh, in which uh, that would do just that. It would, would prohibit anyone from using our county seal uh, on any of their letterhead, on any of their promotions, uh, to make it look as if they were promoting something on behalf of the county when in fact they were not promoting something on behalf of the county. So that would protect the county on that end of it. But there is, uh, you do indicate because it, it, in the stat, in the ordinance it says without approval of the county manager. So there's a process in place that if some <coughs> someone, Little League for instance, yeah. wants to use uh, the county seal to advertise or whatever, we, we then have something in place where they can come and ask, right. and with our prior approval, right. then, then they can use it. Yeah. Or if we've got a joint venture going to someone and they want to advertise and use the county seal on that joint venture with something uh, on some event, okay. then you've got that opportunity. I've built okay. that into the statute itself. Thank you. Any questions? So we would register this with the Secretary of State to perfect no the protection. They, they will not even allow it to be registered anymore it just becomes a local ordinance and that local ordinance is is a law in and of itself okay. for Davie County and is actually enforceable through the DA's office and through the Sheriff's Department if need be okay. all right well, we have this is a public hearing so we need to okay. Uh, the steps. Chair has announced this is the hour and date of the public hearing on the proposal to add a new section 130.03 County Seal Ordinance to David County Code of Ordinance. It's been uh, duly publicized and noticed in the public hearing in the newspaper with general circulation in David County is required by uh, North Carolina General Statutes 160A 20G of the Act. And the clerk to the board has attached an affidavit showing the publication in said paper and dates at least 10 days prior to the date of this hearing. I'd ask anyone who wished to comment. Uh, on this new proposed ordinance section, come forward to the podium, state your full name of the board, and then comment on the proposal. Mr. Chairman, seeing no one come forward to comment, I turn the public hearing back over to you as board chair. Close the public hearing comment section. This public hearing providing the board the opportunity to discuss among yourselves what any action you wish to take with regards to this matter. Okay, thank you. We will declare the public hearing closed. Entertain or any further discussion about the adoption and protection of our county seal. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve. So, so motion to approve the ordinance as as presented. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Right. So, okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the ordinance as presented, raise your hand. Okay, that is. Unanimous. Thank you. Next, we move to the consent agenda. Anybody have any questions or concerns about the consent agenda? Seeing none, entertain a motion to approve. Motion. Go ahead. Go ahead. Motion to approve. Second. <laughs> All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, that passes. Thank you. Next, County Manager's Report, Mr. Eller. I'll be very brief. I just want to uh, continually uh, brag about our department heads and uh, the great work that they and their staff have been doing uh, over the past few months as we get ready to go in our strategic planning season, but also I uh, can't believe we're, all, we're getting ready to talk about budget again before too long, but we will. Uh, and, and so they've, they've just been doing a lot of work and very proud of them. 
Uh, as I told the board, we hope to have uh, working with Mr. Uh, uh, Meadwell and um, uh, Mr. Bird to try to get a ribbon cutting event out at the uh, new EMS2 base. So uh, more information will be coming uh, to all of you and citizens about that issue, uh, as well as um, working with our community college on enhanced programming, uh, particularly in the medical field at our old hospital site, which we're pleased about. More information will be forthcoming about that as well. Uh, continue to work on human services consolidation with department heads and uh, still uh, wanting to make sure that the, the department heads uh, have plenty of say in that process and help me through that and they've been great so far working with me on that. We hope to have a recommendation to you soon about that. Space study, um, we had our uh, on-site interviews with um, uh, departments, so the, the, the vendor met with each department head. Uh, the month of August will be spent actually doing facility sites and visits and looking in, in all the corridors and, and uh, uh, places in all of our buildings and so they'll have a better idea of what we're dealing with there. So we're really excited that that's moving forward as we look toward our future capital improvements here in the county. I uh, also want to thank the uh, sheriff for his continued conversations with Bermuda Run on uh, enhanced services down there and uh, uh, possibly providing uh, more services to them uh, as well. And uh, I think that'll be a good model for, uh, for future uh, reference for uh, uh, any enhanced services that we look at. So thanks, Sheriff, for that. Uh, and, and just in general, I appreciate uh, getting through some of these uh, these detailed things we talked about tonight, but all of which are important, and uh, I'm just uh, continually impressed by Davy County and your staff. So thank you. Thank you. All right, any old business to come before us this evening? <coughs> okay, I'm seeing none. Any new business? All right. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to go into closed session pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11-A6 to consider the performance review of a public officer. Someone would like to make that motion. So I'll move. Second. The motion is second. All in favor, raise your hand. We are in closed session. We'll be back in here <coughs> in a few minutes. Thank you. Alan Moore hanging around. <laughs> Slow night at home. Yeah. All right. Um, I will. Football season. That's right. Uh, we have commissioner's comments. I will we'll make an executive decision to dispense with those unless someone's really got something they want to say. <laughs> I want to thank Mr. Gallimore for staying around. <laughs> now, we've got another one back in there in the closet, oh, too. Oh, and the one in the closet. <laughs> it's in the back cave, Tiffany. Yeah. Okay. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and second. All in favor? 5-0. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. You.